Hi everyone, this is the first video in our series, To the Roots, where we look at key concepts in the social sciences. In this episode, we are going to talk about population, resource use, and debates over whether there are just too many people in the world. Most folks are aware that there are a lot of people on this planet. At the beginning of 2022, we have over 7.9 billion of them. There have never been this many people in the world before, and our global population has exploded over the past couple of centuries. It wasn't until 1800 that there were even 1 billion people in the world, and there were only 2 billion in 1930. Since then, we've added almost another 6 billion people to the Earth in about 92 years. So right off the bat, we need to ask a really important question. Is this a problem? Well, to answer that, however, depends a great deal on what you think about people. Are they consuming locusts just devouring the earth? Are other people just your competition for scarce resources? Or do you see people as creators? Creators of resources, people who make the stuff you buy, people who heal you when you are sick, people you play games with, people who keep you safe, people you fall in love with, or in my case, people who feed you and pet you on command. It turns out that what we think about people and how we perceive their value has some pretty big impacts on how we think about not just population debates in the abstract sense, but the way we think about concrete issues like environmental management, immigration, education, labor laws, social welfare programs, and many other economic and political policies. Okay, to make sense of population, let's look at three major perspectives. Let's start with perhaps the most well-known person who talks about population, Thomas Malthus. Malthus is this old British dude who was thinking about why there was starvation and famine in the world back in the late 1700s. One of his central points was that the human population tends to grow geometrically. In other words, two people make four people, who make eight people, who make 16, who then make 32, who make 64, who then make 128, and so on. But Malthus argued that food production only grew arithmetically. So in other words, if one year you produced one bushel of corn, the next you might get two, and then three, and then four, and then five, and so on. So because of this, he argued that at some point, your population was destined to outstrip your resources. And Malthus believed that when your population curve hits your resource curve, the population is going to be corrected. And by this, we mean lots of people die by things like famine, war, and disease. So your population may then recover again and swing upward, but it is destined to hit the limit of available resources again and crash once more. Significantly, Malthus argues that if you help people who are in the midst of this mass death, all you are really doing is kicking the can down the road a bit because there will still be more people than resources. There will therefore inevitably be another episode of mass death because the problem is that there are simply more people than can be provided resources to live. From this perspective, the only real solution, if you want to avoid these episodes of famine and mass death, is that you have to have fewer children. Well, how do you do this? Well, Malthus said folks have to have moral restraint, which is old school English guy talk for stop having sex so damn much, you heathens. The problem, of course, is who wants to do that? Luckily, as time went on, we got advances in contraception, and so now we have neo-Malthusians who emphasize that it's okay to get down, just use some family planning. Now, while there is that important difference, neo-Malthusians still hold that when you see people suffering from want or famine, that the problem is basically demographic. They believe there are simply too many people and not enough food. And the only real solution is to let the deaths run their course and bring down the birth rate for a better situation in the long term. So while this Malthusian conventional wisdom is still believed by some today, other folks decided to put Malthus's theories to the test. As we know, the Earth's population has been skyrocketing, and it roughly doubled from 3 billion people in 1960 to about 6 billion in the year 2000. So as the population grew at this extreme rate, what actually happened to food production? Well, it turns out that food production actually went up more than the population numbers. In fact, 
studies done by Esther Bozerup demonstrated that the amount of calories of food produced per person increased from around 2,300 calories per day when there were 3 billion people on the planet to about 2,800 calories per day when there were 6 billion people on the Earth. So how can this be? Well, this only makes sense if we recognize that people don't just consume resources, they also produce them. After all, if many of those billions of new people are out there growing more food and growing more than they themselves are consuming, well, you'd expect that there would be more food per person. This idea is summed up nicely in a saying from Chinese history attributed to Mao Zedong that says, every mouth comes with two hands. And of course, once you have the clip art for the pimp hat, you just have to keep rolling with that, so Mao gets one too. So anyway, the idea that every mouth comes with two hands means that for every person you add to the, your population, that you're actually making more than they use. This perspective is sometimes referred to as cornucopian, from the idea of the cornucopia, which is the horn of plenty that you may have seen at Thanksgiving, or you might know it as the place with all the weapons and Hunger Games, but that's beside the point. The idea is basically that we don't really need to worry about increases in population because we'll keep producing more food. One advantage of this perspective is that it is backed up by some real uh, hard, you know, real world data that indicates that Malthus's theory has a real fundamental flaw. Malthus thought agricultural production would always be outstripped by a rising population. Bozerup and others, however, have shown that that simply is not true. Okay, so if it's true that there is more food per person nowadays than when the population was smaller, then why do we still have people dying of famine and starvation? If the problem isn't simply too many people chasing too few resources, why do we still have these episodes of mass death? Well, to be blunt, the resources of the Earth are distributed in a very uneven way. One of the 19th century theorists to most explicitly point this out was Karl Marx, who is best known for his critiques of capitalism. And just for good measure, let's not just have Marx, but let's also give him the hat too so he could be sexy Marx. Anyway, one of the things Marx and others have demonstrated is that when you see famine or starvation, the problem is almost never that there are too many people. Instead, some people are, bringing, uh, are binging on more than enough resources, while others are in precarious situations where there are economic and political barriers that block their ability to access the resources that are in fact quite plentiful. Famine then is a political and economic outcome, not the result of there simply being too many people as Malthus thought. Okay, so we have these three perspectives on population and we can critique each of them, but it is important to recognize that they all have some good points. First, the cornucopians are correct that based on really reliable data, the more humans there are on Earth, the more food they have been able to produce per person. On the other hand, the Marxists are correct when, we, uh, when they say that, you know, when we see hunger and starvation, that it's not the result of too many people being somewhere, but instead, famine is largely the result of a maldistribution of resources or some kind of political, economic, or environmental instability that is disrupting the production and distributions of resources that do actually already exist. So when we see famine, it is not that too many people ate all the food, it is that some, of the, some group of people have lost access to food, or they can't afford to buy the food that exists. It is a political or economic problem that can be fixed with political will and action. So, as for Malthus and his supporters, well, we have already pointed out that one important facet of his work was basically just dead wrong. Population growth does not outstrip food production. However, Malthus does bring up a point about limits to population growth in general that we should think about a bit more. The data may show that 6 billion people can produce more food per person than 3 billion people did, but don't we think there must be a limit to this at some point? Can we still produce more food per person if we have 20 billion people? What about 100 billion people? What about 85 trillion people? Surely there must be a limit out there somewhere. This is where it's helpful to introduce one more important concept 
and it's our 50 cent phrase for the day. The phrase is, the global human appropriation of net primary production. If that sounds like a mouthful, there's always the catchy acronym, HANAPAPAPA. -pa. Well, okay, maybe not very catchy. Scientists need to work on that one. But the global human appropriation of net primary production is a very important concept. This is the percentage of all photosynthesis going on in the world that goes directly to growing food to sustain the human population. In other words, it's the percentage of plant growth going on in the world that finds its way into the mouths of humans. Now, for most of human history, this figure was much less than 1%. Today, however, there are varying estimates for this, but it is figured to be between about 20 to 40% of all terrestrial photosynthesis goes to human consumption. So when cornucopians and Marxists point out that humans have been able to produce more calories per person with seven plus billion people on the planet than when there were a few billion, we should ask where those extra calories have come from. To make a long story short, they have come from the copious use of fossil fuels in the human agricultural system, as well as the clearing of all sorts of habitats to make way for agricultural production for human consumption either directly when people eat grains and vegetables, or when we produce feed that humans then eat. So this begs the question, okay, so if all the calories that a growing number of humans are consuming represent an ever-increasing percentage of all the photosynthesis going on in the world, what's the limit? Well, obviously it can't be over 100%, but it might also make a lot of sense that the percentage is in fact much lower. Because of the complexity of global environmental systems, it may be difficult to come to a definitive number, but it is reasonable to assume that an ecological system will start to fray when too much energy is being funneled to one species in the food web at the expense of all the other organisms. In other words, due to the habitat loss and resulting species extinctions, there may come a point when ecological systems break down long before we get to 100% of global human appropriation of net primary production. So this would seem to mean that there very well might be a limit to how large the human population can get. But there are a couple caveats here. First, perhaps technological advances of some kind can continue to push the maximum threshold even higher. Also, and this is crucial, the amount of resources a person uses is quite variable. It doesn't make a lot of sense to ask if the world can hold 9 billion people or 90 billion people, because a lot depends on just what those people are doing. For instance, if everyone is flying on airplanes, owning two cars, and running their air conditioners all day, it takes a lot more resources to support that population than one where everybody isn't doing that. Also, because of the massive amounts of feed it takes to produce a relatively small amount of meat, the same amount of agricultural production could likely support either 5 billion carnivores or over 25 billion vegans. So here are today's take-home points. Number one, there is no magic number of people where the earth goes from being okay to being overpopulated. It depends on what people are doing. Number two, when you see famine and starvation in the world today, that is not the result of too many people. Malthus was dead wrong about that, and so are the people who keep parroting that fallacy today. The third big take-home point is whether we see people as simply consumers of resources or as beings who are also creators of resources makes a big difference in how we set up economic and political policies. If we look at migrants coming into a country or people in poverty accessing social services, or kids seeking education, or people getting health care, as examples of people simply, quote, taking resources from everyone else, then that attitude can be used to justify social exclusion, cutting social programs, gutting public education, and keeping health care expensive and exclusive. If, however, we think of people as also producers, people who create economic value, who produce the food we eat, who make the things we use, who pay taxes for social projects that we also benefit from, people who teach our kids, who work to restore our environments and who help keep us healthy, well, then it will lead us to a whole different approach to helping folks when they are in times of need. In other words, when we talk about population, we can't forget that we aren't just talking about some abstract mass of humanity. 
After all, you are also part of that population, and so is everyone you know and care about. So that's all for today. Thanks for joining me, and keep an eye out for more episodes of To The Roots. Thank you.